Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Cautionary Tales from the French Revolution. I'm Keelan Burke, the Director of Fellowships and Academic Programs at the Newberry Library. And I'm here today with Christine Adams, Professor of History at St. Mary's College in Maryland, and an Andrew W. Mellon Fellow, Foundation Long-Term Fellow at the Newberry Library this year. Today, we will be talking about three flashpoints in the French Revolution, the September massacres of 1792, the reign of terror and the fall of Maximilien Robespierre that will provide us with cautionary tales as we contemplate the challenges facing American democracy today. We will be taking questions during our conversation today. If you're joining us on Zoom, you can put your questions in the chat. For those of you joining on Facebook or YouTube, and if you have a question, please write those into the comments and we'll be monitoring that. Um, so Christine, thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited to um, talk this afternoon. Um, I'd like to go ahead and start with um, the September massacres, but I'm first, I'm hoping you can give us um, a little bit of scene setting. So can you give us a quick refresher on what happened leading up to 1792 with a particular eye thinking about kind of po the political scene, but also the press and the media? Right. Okay. Thank you so much for arranging this, Keelan. I'm really happy to be here. I'm very appreciative to the Newberry Library for, for hosting it and to Alex Teller and Matt Clark for setting things up. And I'm really excited to talk to you today. So, so to, to set the scene, to go back to the beginning, um, the French Revolution broke out in 1789 and, and historians debate the causes, but it looked like the, the French were going to move towards a constitutional monarchy as their form of government. Um, the problem was, or one of the problems was that the king, Louis XVI, was less than thrilled about losing his power. Um, and there were a lot of other people too, especially the nobility and the Catholic Church, um, who opposed the shift to a more democratic form of government. And they worked in some cases actively to undermine the new government. So the right was, the result was that, that people on the political left, those who favored more democratic institutions, became increasingly radicalized as in response to what they saw as resistance from, from the monarchical right. So the result is that through 1791 and 1792, the political scene in France becomes increasingly tense. You have outbreaks of violence, you have lynchings, and this is spurred along by the media, um, both on the political left and also the monarchist right. Um, one of the things that the French Revolution had done is it instituted freedom of the press. And so you have this explosion of newspapers, um, a lot of which only last a few months, but, but you have a lot of pretty extreme newspapers that come into, into existence. And while some journalists tried to be objective, as they could be, there's a lot of them that just amplified wild rumors um, and, and put out fake news in some cases. The left-wing press tends to be more radical than, than the National Assembly, than the government in demanding change. And you see in a lot of newspapers that they just don't trust the institutions of government. And the journalists employ pretty wild rhetoric to fire up common people against the elite and especially against the former nobility and against the church too. Probably the most radical newspaper that people would have heard of is Jean-Paul Marat's L'Ami du Peuple, The Friend of the People. Um, there's another one called Père Chaine, which sort of is, is the voice of a Parisian working class man. And, and both of them try to fire up the, the common people against the king, against the nobility, and against um, the government that's moving too slow. So, so that's sort of, a, that's the context. That's, that's what people are reading, that's what they're hearing, and it builds tensions. So. Wonderful. Thank so. you. Um, I really appreciate having you kind of put us in perspective so we can kind of get an idea of what it would be like, you know, on the ground or thinking what people would be looking at, consuming, what's kind of the political ferment around what's going on. Um, so then how does that get us to se the September massacres? What's happening leading up to kind of what's those the immediate things that are setting off? Um, you know, it has a very dramatic title of massacres. Sure. Now, so <laughs> yeah. How do we get from lots of um, discussion, you know, obviously heated rhetoric on both sides to this moment? Actual violence. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to understand that Paris in the summer of 1792 is a powder keg. In part, this is because France had gone to war um, with both Austria and with Prussia in early 1792. The war was not going well for the French at this point. And a lot of people were convinced that the king and members of the nobility were in league with France's enemies, um, the other crowned heads of Europe. And that's not entirely wrong. There were a lot of people who had emigrated from France who were living in these courts abroad who were trying to encourage the war on France. The emperor of Austria was in fact the queen's nephew. So there were these connections. 
And as tensions grow over the course of the summer of 1792, the people of Paris actually stormed the Tuileries Palace on August 10th of 1792. The Tuileries Palace was the home of the king and queen. Um, they're taken prisoner. The government agrees to the demands of the Paris Commune, which controls the Parisian government, and they suspend the king's authority. And this basically ends the king's power. This is the end of the monarchy. France is going to become a republic on September 21st of 1792. But in the meantime, throughout the month of August, um, tensions are mounting. The King, the, the Duke of Brunswick is the individual who was leading the Prussian troops. He had issued a document in July called the Brunswick Manifesto, which promised that if anything happened to the King and Queen, that he would visit the most severe retribution upon the people of Paris, which is pretty terrifying to the people of Paris as the Prussian army is bearing down on them in August of 1792. Now, to sort of add to the mix of tension, French supporters of the revolution at this point, they're convinced that counter-revolutionaries within the country are in league with emigres and with foreign armies. So what they do is they intensify efforts to root out any traitors at home. And we see numerous acts of violence. We see lynchings of suspected conspirators throughout the country during the month of August. And of course, they're especially suspicious of priests and former members of the nobility. And we, what we start to see is that the prisons in Paris start to fill up as people are arrested, often on, on pretty flimsy grounds. And then sort of the trigger for the massacres is that on August 31st, Parisians learned that the Prussian army had taken the French key fortress of Verdun um, two days earlier. And what that meant is that the path to the city of Paris basically lay open for the Prussian armies. So citizens are urged to, to prepare to defend the nation and Parisians become obsessed with the idea that these aristocratic and priest-led anti-revolutionary plots are being hatched in the prisons. And they're encouraged in thinking this, once again, by journalists who take the, the lead in rallying people to action. And in fact, in L'Ami de Peuple, the, the, the radical newspaper I mentioned, Marat, he urges his readers, and, and this is a quote, he, he calls on them to go to the Abbey prison to seize priests and especially the officers of the Swiss Guard and their accomplices and run a sword through them. Okay. Now, his is probably one of the most active voices urging on these massacres that take place, and he's going to pay a price for it. Um, some of you may be familiar with the famous <laughs> painting of Marat in the bathtub having been stabbed to death by Charlotte Corday, and she kills him in large part in response to his role in the September massacres. But it's not just journalists who are egging people on. Um, politicians are as well. And famously on September 2nd, the Minister of Justice, who is a, a radical Jacobin, um, Cordelier, um, Georges Danton, he gives this rousing speech in which he tells the Parisians that, um, you know, to conquer the enemies, we need, we need boldness, more boldness, always boldness, and then France is saved. Um, and a lot of people believe that this speech, you know, in this moment of tension, really helped to trigger the attacks um, that take place. Later on, um, Danton and other politicians are actually going to be accused of either encouraging the massacres or not doing enough to stop them. So they become tainted with this, even if they were not themselves killing people, right? Um, now, one sort of interesting side note is that the Legislative Assembly had already armed volunteers with pikes to defend the city of Paris from Prussians and, and something that David Bell points out in his book, The First Total War. So he says, pikes are not exactly practical weapons for, for holding off the Prussians. On the other hand, they can be quite effective when you start trying to massacre people in prisons. And so, so you've got all these Parisians with pikes. So September 2nd, Danton gives a speech. That afternoon, the massacres start. So, Thank you. Um, for those of us who may be joining us now, um, we're talking with um, Professor Christine Adams with, about cautionary tales from the French Revolution. Um, and we are now getting to one of those um, tales. Um, she's given us some background leading up to the September massacres. And now, um, Chris, can you tell us exactly what happened at the massacres? So we've got this powder cake in Paris. We've got um, the fear that um, the Prussians are heading in. And then we have this inflammatory speech coming from both the media and from politicians in power. Right. Right. So, so the first people murdered actually are counter-revolutionary priests. They were in the process of being transported to the Abbey prison, the place that Marat had singled out, right? Um, priests are among the first major victims of the attack because they're associated, as I said, with these counter-revolutionary forces, although probably the most famous victim of the massacres is the Princess de Lambal. She was one of Marie Antoinette's closest friends. Um, she was in prison at the time and the 
um, the revolutionaries hack off her head and they put it on a pike and and reportedly they sort of like paraded underneath Marie Antoinette's window waving the head around. But anyway, the killings spread very quickly to other prisons. You have these mobs of patriots, as they call themselves, that are convinced that treasonous plots are being hatched there in collusion with former aristocrats. Um, this goes on for several days. By the time the slaughter ends on September 6th, somewhere between 1,100 and 1,400 people had died. Um, it's obviously hard to know the exact numbers, so it's within that range. Most of the people killed were men, but there were some women, there were some adolescent boys. Um, about two thirds of the people killed were not political prisoners or conspirators. Um, I mean, the biggest single group probably is, is priests, but, but you have a lot of common criminals, prostitutes are, are being held in prison. A lot of them are killed. Um, so a lot of people locked up on minor offenses go down in the September massacres. So. Thank you. So we have um, uh, obviously a large scale massacre that is on the ground being, being um, uh, executed. Bad choice of words, good choice of words by um, a lot of just common Traded. people, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, okay, so I'm gonna, um, after, I'm gonna have you talk to us about um, what happens afterwards, but we have a couple of questions um, okay, from sure. the audience. So one of them, okay. um, which I think helps in, because you, as you mentioned, Marat and that painting of his, um, of his assassination. So um, Sandra on Facebook um, wants to know more about what is the role of artists like Giraudet and David in the revolution? Um, so I know you are historian, not art historian, but right. maybe you can give us um, just a little bit of a, a taste of um, kind of if artists are playing a role in the same or a different way than maybe the media or the politicians are. Well, David um, is in fact a Jacobin. He's pretty closely allied with Robespierre, in fact, um, and is going to go to prison for a time after the reign of terror comes to an end as a, as a terrorist. And so he is a pretty active supporter. And, you know, he, he famously painted a, a picture of the, the oath of the tennis court. Um, he is somebody who pretty actively is, is promoting the revolution. Um, Jode, I know less about his art during the revolution. I know more about his portraits afterwards, which is the period that I am looking at right now, so. Thank you. Um, so can you tell us, so all of this massacre has happened and obviously this is something that it's not just being um, noticed in France, it's getting international attention sure, as well. Sure. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what happens after this? So this, this there's this very big um, event and then we have um, obviously there's an aftermath to deal with. So right, what's happening right. in France after it? And then also kind of, can you give us a sense of some sort of international, um, you know, uh, 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 thoughts from abroad? Right. Well, people abroad are horrified. I mean, this is one of the things that really sort of sets the image of the French revolutionaries as, as blood drinkers, as bloodthirsty, as these, these, these out of control animals in a sense. Um, and in fact, a British diplomat who's on the ground <laughs> writes letters back home about what's happening. And he talks about the fury of the enraged populace who slaughtered prisoners. And he says, with circumstances of barbarity too shocking to describe. Um, and there's certainly condemnation within France, but that takes a little longer to, to build up because in the immediate aftermath, even though certainly there are people who are terrified and horrified, you know, the septembriseurs, as they're called, the people who carry out the massacres, they consider themselves heroes. They're patriots. They were trying to save their country. You know, they were trying to protect the nation um, against these these, these counter-revolutionaries. And in the early phases, there are journalists and, and politicians too who praise their actions, who say, you know, okay, maybe this wasn't strictly legal, but, but it was a necessary defense of our nation. Now, as time goes on, it becomes increasingly toxic to be associated with, with that point of view. And complicity in the September massacres over time, um, and certainly by the time the reign of terror comes to an end, eventually becomes a source of shame. Um, historians actually have a hard time today figuring out exactly what role certain politicians played in the, in the, in the September massacres, because they took steps to hide their, their complicity as it becomes more problematic to be associated with that. But it can be hard to get rid of the taint. Um, jean Lombard Talion, for example, who who is going to be one of the people who helps to overthrow Robespierre, he um, is forever sort of dogged by the fact that he, he seemed to have participated or encouraged the, the massacres. So. So, so the people are pretty horrified by this. And the, the two years that follow the September massacres are going to be among the most tumultuous in French history, I think we can say. Um, one of the things that happens, of course, after the massacres is Louis XVI goes on trial 
that fall. He's executed in January of 1793. Um, the French end up at war not only now with Austria and Prussia, but with the English. And so basically the French are facing war on all fronts um, for the next several years. The effort to, to fight the war abroad and then also to quell counter-revolution within the country is the excuse for what is called the reign of terror. Um, the terror, I mean, probably the terror is the period that most people associate with the French Revolution. This is the period when so many people throughout France go to the guillotine. Um, and, and the terror has the support of the Jacobins. The Jacobins are the most radical of the revolutionaries. And they're the group that really has control um, during the period of 1793, 1794. Um, and the terror has support from, from others who want to see the gains of the revolution preserved. They're really concerned about counter-revolutionary activity. They're really concerned about the war that the French are fighting. But of course, as time goes on, it comes to be seen as, as both too brutal and too indiscriminate, especially because by the spring of 1794, um, there's some laws that are put into effect in the country that make it much easier to convict and execute people. Um, and the result is that by, by June of 1794 in particular, you start to see increasing numbers of mass trials, mass executions, and things seem to be rubbing up and getting out of control. Um, the politician who's most blamed for this is Maximilian Robespierre. Um, he's a Jacobin, and he's a member of what's called the Committee of Public Safety. The Committee of Public Safety is essentially the committee in charge of prosecuting the war effort and protecting, defending the French during this time, so. Thank you. Um, for those of you who are joining us now, um, we are talking with to Professor Christine Adams about cautionary tales from the French Revolution. And we have made our way through the September massacres and now we are on to the reign of terror. Um, so we have a couple of questions um, that I'm going to interject. Um, some um, Janice on Facebook had a question about kind of Paris having its back against the wall before the September massacres, which I think you've kind of already addressed talking about the Prussians coming in. Um, we have a couple of questions sort of getting us across the Atlantic. Um, so Terry um, wants to know uh, if you have any thoughts on how these events are being portrayed in the American press at the time in terms of thinking abroad? I have um, a couple of years ago, I had a student who did his, his senior thesis actually comparing the, the British and the American press and their reactions to what was happening in France during the reign of terror. And, and you have a split. I mean, Americans um, tended to be, the, 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 the more radical press in the United States tended to be more sympathetic than, than one might expect, but that that declines as time goes on, as things get bloodier and bloodier. Um, in general, the American newspapers were just being sort of fed information from British newspapers and then from French newspapers. It sort of depended on who they, they had contacts with. So, so, I mean, certainly Americans are following this. Um, and I guess for everybody who's been, <laughs> who, who knows Hamilton, <laughs> they, they know that there was um, a lot of concern in the United States as to whether to support the French. The French had been American allies during the American Revolution, um, but the last thing that George Washington's administration wanted to do was to get yanked into this um, to this conflict. So, thank you. Um, we also had one more question against across the sea, but this may kind of bring us into looking forward a little bit more um, from the Reign of Terror onward. So, um, Ben um, asks about what is the role of the of atrocity propaganda in shaping our memories of the French and the Haitian Revolution? Um, oh yeah. Okay. And then um, so obviously you're a French historian, not a Haitian um, historian, right. but not to say that those are totally um, broken apart. No, um, of course not. Um, yeah, I have colleagues who are, <laughs> who know a lot more about the atrocity literature of the Haitian Revolution than I do. There's, I mean, this is, this is really a burgeoning field in, in French historiography and you can't study the French Revolution anymore without studying what is happening in Haiti at the same time. Um, the atrocity propaganda is really important, although I think that, that what, ha what comes out after the reign of terror in the case of France is probably more important because that atrocity literature is used to retro retroactively shape how people think about the French Revolution in a sense. I mean, in part, this is because there was an active decision or, or an implicit decision that was made um, once Robespierre was brought down to make him the face of the revolution to sort of, um, to, to blame, to place the blame on him. 
Um, and, and probably if you've had a class in, in the French Revolution, Maximilian Robespierre is the name that you know, that he was the person who was responsible for the revolution. Most historians today are less convinced that he actually, actually bears the responsibility for the terror. Um, and Marissa Linton writes about this pretty effectively. She says that we've sort of loaded the blame onto him, that we make him take the rap for it, but that, that really uh, it, it obscures our understanding of this period. So I think just to briefly think about why Robespierre becomes the face of the terror, because it actually has lessons for our current political moment, I think. Um, in the summer of 1794, as the terror was sort of reaching a peak in a sense, there's quite a bit of political infighting going on among politicians within the, the National Convention. A number of revolutionary leaders by this point had already gone to the guillotine, like Danton, and some of Robespierre's fellow revolutionaries start to worry that he was going to go after them next. And in fact, on July 26, he gives this speech to the National Convention in which he suggests, and this is pretty ominous for people who are listening to it, that they're traitors within the National Convention itself, which whom he was ready to expose. And so this brought together all of those people who thought that they might be the ones he was going to expose and who are fearful for their own lives now. They put aside their own differences to bring Robespierre down. Now, these men are sometimes called the Thermidorians. Um, the month this happens is the month of Thermidor, according to the French Revolutionary Calendar. And they launch this offensive in a series of dramatic speeches in front of the National Convention. It leads to the arrest of Napoleon, his two closest associates, and his brother. Um, those four men go to the guillotine on July 28th of 1794, on the 10th of Thermidor. So in the months that follow his death, then, the French people have to come to grips with what had for some people been a period of trauma. Um, and the people who are most at risk in this period are those politicians who had participated in the terror themselves, but who had survived Robespierre's purge. And they have to construct a narrative of some kind that's going to shield them from the responsibility for its excesses. And that's where some of this atrocity literature really starts to appear that blames Napoleon or Robespierre, right? And so, for example, you start to see popular iconography coming out. There's a famous cartoon of, of Robespierre executing the executioner after everybody else in Paris has been beheaded, you know, clearly making the point that he is the one responsible, that he took great pleasure in, in this sort of purge of the people of France. Um, there's other um, popular iconography that's maybe sort of more, more classical, but also more gruesome. There's one in particular that, that portrays Robespierre's death as divine retribution. And you've got all these severed heads piled up all over the place. So, so the, the, the atrocity literature is, is really very effective in creating this, this narrative of the, the terror as a moment of, of national trauma, um, but also placing the blame on Robespierre in this sense. So, and they were pretty effective. I mean, once again, historians, um, they, tend to focus, they tended for a long time to focus on Robespierre as the face of the terror. So. Yeah, it's very much sort of that, you know, what you learned in your AP history in high school. If you, exactly. you know, you learn about the French Revolution and then you learn about the Reign of Terror and Robespierre and then right. you learn about the, the empire afterward. Right. Um, so um, uh, for those of us joining, for those of you joining us now, um, we're talking with Professor Christine Adams about cautionary tales from the French Revolution. Um, and we have gotten ourselves through the Reign of Terror to the Thermidorians, which have an excellent name for somebody who is not a French historian. It's just fun to say. Um, so I'm wondering if now you can kind of zoom out a little bit for us. Um, so you've sure. kind of talked about these, you know, three particular moments. Um, we've talked about the September massacres. We've talked about the reign of terror and also um, kind of the downfall of Robespierre. Um, so what, um, what do you think is important about thinking about this this history in our contemporary moment? Like what, what is yeah. it about, you know, the current, current events that sort of drew your mind immediately to this moment in time, because this is not right. exactly what you're studying right now. So this no, is, it's, 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 it's in your, your, your ambit, but it's not right. exactly the thing. So right. Tell right. Us a little more. I've been doing quite a bit of reading about Thermidor and that sort of takes us back, you know, to, to these events that preceded in a sense. And I guess the thing that, that made me start thinking about this um, in particular, in this particular moment is you know, we've had this sort of now cataclysmic event with the, the assault in the Capitol last week. And, you know, there's a particular context in which this happened, a, a, an atmosphere of paranoia and rumor and fake news and a violent speech on the part of a politician that encouraged people to think that they were behaving lawfully and, and sort of, you know, protecting, protecting our country by, um, by rooting out um, traitors in a sense. 
And, and that made me think about this moment, but it also makes me nervous, right? Because, you know, what the Thermidorians tried to do is they tried to make one person responsible and to basically make the argument that, okay, Robespierre now is gone. You know, the, the person who was responsible for this, this unrest, for this trauma, he's gone. And now we can sort of get back to normal, move ahead, sort of construct a stable republic. Um, and what the politicians tried to do in the wake of Robespierre's execution is they try to put together a new government that would be Republican, but more conservative and, and keep things under control. But, but, you know, this new government called the Directory that emerges, it faces, it faces immense challenges that Robespierre's death cannot solve. The people of France remain politically very divided, just like we today remain politically very divided. The nation was still at war, facing immense economic hardships. We are not at war. Well, I guess we are. <laughs> we're at war, but the, the bigger problem we're facing is the coronavirus, right, that, that the new administration will have to deal with. And the larger problem, and this, this is not, I mean, you can't draw, or obviously you can never draw exact parallels, but, but the, the politicians of the directory, they're not monarchists, but they lack a genuine commitment to democratic institutions, even with Robespierre gone. And what's going to happen in both 1797 and 1798 is that the government is going to overturn election results because they don't like what the results were. And these kinds of actions, the fact that you have a political elite that are not committed to democracy, that are willing to set it aside, it really lessened the French public's commitment to democratic institutions. It convinced them that all politicians were corrupt. Um, it made them pretty cynical and it was impossible to paper over the very deep political and social divisions in the country as a result. And so, so we all know the end of the story here. I mean, that opened the path for a young and charismatic general, Napoleon Bonaparte, to come to power in a coup. And so, so I think that, you know, as we sort of move forward from the political moment that we're in today, um, the president will be gone next week. We will have a new administration inaugurated, but we really need to keep a close eye on, I think, what is happening and and you know, keep our eye on a defense of democratic institutions um, as time goes on. Because if you, if if politicians show contempt for those institutions, then the public will also um, grow disaffected with them. So, thank you. Um, so we have. Um, I'm going to wrap up. Um, I'm, apologies that I will not be able to get to everybody's questions. We've had some great ones in the chat, um, but I'm going to wrap up with. Um, one of our last questions from the audience and also a question to um, Christine about her project that she's working on here at the Newberry. Um, and so the question from Connie is, um, do you have any recommendations for books to begin studying this period? And oh, goodness, you so don't many. have to say your book, um, <laughs> but you can say your books. Um, so, so. But also, and then also thinking more broadly, tell us about the kinds of things that you're working on now and the book that we can look and, forward to um, okay. that you will be writing in the not too distant future. So there are just so many, so many great books on the, the French Revolution for stuff that I've been looking at immediately because I've been focusing on the, the um, period post Thermidor and, and some of the sort of um, discussion of rewriting the narrative. Ronan Steinberg's recent book on the afterlife of the terror is really a great place to sort of look at how this, this narrative of the terror was constructed. Um, Howard G. Brown has also, um, and I, I can't remember the, the name off the top of my head of his book, but, but he has written some really interesting stuff about um, um, the, the, the narrative that the Thermidorians are able to, to construct in the wake of the, the terror. Um, David Bell has a new book out that's about, about Napoleon Bonaparte that would be really interesting to look at. If you're interested in the press, um, the two best known historians of the press are Jack Sensor and Jeremy Popkin, who have both written extensively about the right wing and the left wing press. So, those are those are all good good places to start. Um, and oh, and Marissa Linton's book on Robespierre is also an excellent an excellent choice. So, um, for my my own project, um, which I'm really excited about, um, that I'm working on here at the Newberry, I'm calling it for the time being um, the Meveilleuse and their impact on the French social imaginary, 1794 through 1799 and beyond. Um, the Meveilleuse, or the Marvelous Ones is how it translates. This was a group of young and stylish Parisian women who really sort of come to be um, 
shorthand for the, the era of the directory and the imagination of French historians. They were, I, to, to use modern terminology, sort of social influencers at the time. Um, they are, are fashion icons. They're all the popular places in Paris in 1796 and 1797. The press follows them really carefully. Um, the thing that I'm sort of interested in is the Merveilleuse as a cultural phenomenon, as well as their, their function in the historical imaginary. And, and I'm interested in the fact that the fixation that historians had on their beauty and style and their sexuality, because they were known for wearing, wearing very revealing clothes, um, that it sort of obscures their political influence because they were also politically influential. They were connected to the men of the directory. Some of them were interested clearly in politics themselves. Um, but what we have find, find in the historiography is just this emphasis on their, their licentiousness and their, their link to the decadence of the directory, and it becomes a cautionary tale for historians in the 19th and 20th century of what happens when you let women become too politically and culturally influential. So, so what I'm using here at the Newberry are, is the great collection of French revolutionary newspapers that, that you guys have here, and I'm really excited to, to delve into them. So um, anyway, because of the project, I've been thinking, thinking and reading a lot about French politics post Thermidor and the social and political costs, of, I think, of the failure to really come to grips with, with the terror and with France's political divisions and, and sort of what that, you know, how we can use that to learn today. I mean, I want to stress that history never repeats itself. We are not living through a second French Revolution, and I do not want to say that these, these examples are exact parallels. They are obviously not. History is contingent, but history can be useful to think with. So. Thank you very much. This has been absolutely delightful to talk with you about this this afternoon. Um, so thank you for joining us and thank you for everybody out there who is joining us and watching this. Um, I will um, also say that when, for future programming, go ahead and visit newberry.org because we have more virtual um, discussions and programming in the future. Um, I will also say as a plug for wonderful things on the internet that you can get to from your house about the Newberry is our French Revolutionary Pamphlet Collection, um, which is heavily digitized. So um, if you feel like just dipping a toe into the waters of um, French Revolutionary Pamphlet discussions, um, you can find that on the Newberry's website. Um, so thank you again, um, Christine. It was a 